Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Hudson Institute Think Tank in Washington, D.C. to talk to my good friend, Dr. Patrick Cronin, who is the Endowed Chair uh, for Asia Studies here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, Patrick, talk to us a little bit about China's new defense white paper. Uh, there are folks who are saying that this is more messaging than reality, but it is uh, one of the world's most important powers, and this is a bit of a strategic roadmap, and betting against China developing some of these capabilities has been a losing proposition. What were some of the things that stood out most to you as an American strategist looking at China? Well, first, I would encourage everybody to read Taylor Fravel's new book on China's defense uh, papers. He's actually gone through meticulously the public papers of China uh, and, and all the white papers that have been issued in the past. That will give you a baseline from which to judge this new white paper. Now, I think Taylor doesn't go far enough in terms of thinking about what China's doing that's not written about publicly by the Chinese. And I think that's where uh, it's a bit closer to the administration concern about what China's doing on a lot of fronts, including political warfare interference, subversion, uh, economic coercion, um, on top of things like undersea warfare, things in uh, anti satellite weapons, cyberspace, the new domains with electromagnetic spectrum as well. All of those are areas that should be concerning us. And in the latest white paper, indeed, China does signal, in between all the propaganda and all the criticisms of the United States and kind of the self congratulatory reasons why China has to be engaged in this sort of global, sort of supporting global humanity and, and win win situations, there is some clear language that. It is about technology. It is about information power. It is about artificial intelligence. Information power is the single most important element that cuts across China's modern military, and not just their military, but I think their diplomatic and propaganda and economic affairs as well. It's about big data. Big data is the holy grail of intelligence in the 21st century, as, um, uh, as it's been called by a former spy chief in Britain. Um, and he's right. Um, and at the same time, um, big data and information are about informatized warfare or informationized warfare. As the white paper talks about China being able to fight a quick uh, war where they can essentially shut out the lights. They can shut off our ships, right? Not just through the electromagnetic spectrum, maybe through things that are being called propulsion disruptors. I mean, I'm going to get, you know, that's not in the white paper, but all of those things become possible when you think about what China might be working on opaquely, because they're not announcing everything they're working on. They're announcing a lot of things, but they're not announcing and showing us everything. And what we do see in places like Subi Reef, Mischief Reef, um, um, you know, in, in the South China Sea and the Spratly Islands, they have not only just um, reclaimed the land around these islets and rocks in the last seven, six years, um, but they've built them up into major information technology fortresses. Um, why? What are they doing with all those information power systems? Well, they're doing four or five or six different kinds of missions with them in terms of both being able to deny us uh, access, if you will, the A2AD, anti-access area denial capability, um, but also deny us our eyes and ears, space, cyberspace. Um, they're trying to collect big data in the region. They're trying to uh, ensure that they can absolutely control the South China Sea, air, sea space, um, if they need to. And that's what they're working on in a microcosm. That's what they're doing around their entire periphery and beyond, reaching globally. So information in the high tech gets to it. The high tech also intersects, as I mentioned, their economic strategy. Because their biggest strategy, they're not looking for war. They're looking for economic dominance and preeminence to, as they reassert themselves to the center stage of the global affairs. And they think that economic um, access to resources and technology, preeminence in technology, are the two key drivers. So this is a defense white paper that essentially is consistent with everything I see about their Made in China 2025 type of strategy of looking for leadership in the top technologies of the 21st century, but also in their Belt and Road Initiative, looking for um, absolutely global reach, especially to resource centers that are vital for keeping the Chinese economy growing and going fast. Uh, and how does the United States and its allies have to adjust uh, as a consequence? It's been two years since the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Does the United States and do its allies have to trim their sails accordingly based on this new um, white paper from Beijing? Well, we do have to change. Um, the white paper doesn't tell us everything that China's doing. And as I say, the, the Chinese have to be looked at as a continuum in terms of their investments. So the white paper is giving us some inkling of what they're doing on the defense side. 
But they're also pointing to the fact that most of their strategy is economic. It's political warfare. That's a phrase that's not quite accurate or used by everybody. The RAND Corporation has used this in a book last year called Modern Political Warfare, though. I'm using it in that sense, the same sense George Kennan used it at the end of World War II, talking about all means short of war. So China's really mastering the toolkit and able to use things like economic inducement and bribery and co-option, but subversion and information power and cyber uh, propaganda. Um, ramming ships, using maritime militia uh, as a, a basically a navy, a third navy, uh, as er Andrew Erickson's called it. Um, all of these things are being used as part of a political warfare strategy to keep promoting uh, Chinese control, sovereignty, influence, power, and building up that economic strategy I'm talking about why, by acquiring preeminent technologies. So the United States needs to innovate um, in these high technology areas. We have to recognize that it can't all come from the government because most of the innovation is occurring still in the private sector, so we have to figure out new ways to innovate between public-private partnerships. Um, we have to make sure that our defenses are strong, but not so strong in any one area. They have to be balanced forces. The reason for that is the Chinese are opportunistic. They will go to where we are weak. They will go to where we are not. If the Philippines under Pri President Duterte is the weak link, they will co-opt him, and they have in, 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 in many ways. Um, if, if they find that our weakness is space, because we don't do anything to protect our assets in space, they'll go after that. If they find that through missile deployments, they can put at risk our high value uh, carrier battle groups, they will do that, and they've done that. Um, if they find that they can use fishing fleets, uh, just, you know, seeming fishing fleets uh, as basically naval combatants, they can do that against lesser components. So they're, they're able to do all of these things, so we have to be far more intelligent about the full spread of the toolkit that China's using. Now that's not easy to, to deliver a message to the Pentagon saying, look, there's a big toolkit out there they're using. We're only using part of the tools. We have some really fine tools. We've got some of the best. Uh, we're leaders in some of these things, but we're both losing some of the leadership because of intellectual property theft and espionage, but we're also not minding the fact that they, they are able to use much less expensive means, political means. Subversion doesn't cost very much. Um, building something creative, constructive, open, democratic, that's tough. It's expensive. It takes time. Um, you have setbacks. Um, so we have, we have a hard row. That's why we need allies and partners. Um, and I think the Pentagon statements at least get this right. They put allies and partners at the center of U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific and I think globally. I think that is a, a key message. We cannot do this alone. Um, this is not anti-China, right? This is not, <laughs> China's not uh, anti-U.S. per se, but they're very pro-China. Well, we need to be very pro-America and pro-democracy and pro uh, sort of international system. Um, that's not globalism versus nationalism. That's a false choice. We are nationalists within a global system that we should support at the same time. They have to coexist, just as we have to coexist with a big China, we have to coexist with a big Russia, but we're foolhardy if we don't keep strong, and our strength has to be balanced and varied and comprehensive. Dr. Patrick Cronin uh, of Thank the you. Hudson Institute. Always a pleasure, Patrick. Thank my, you so much. My pleasure, Vago. Good luck.